All right. Hey, we'll go ahead and get started. Go grab your snacks, roll it in. Sometimes you just have those days. It feels like, you know, I, I would tease people. I would tease people for, for kind of rolling late today. I woke up at 20 after 8 this morning. I did not make it to church on time today. So I, I feel that, man. Hey, good to see everybody today. We're going to jump in today. I'm going to tell you, uh, I know it's uh, baseball season and the, the, the Padres came back from a terrible loss, but I know we got a few football fans in here. We were discussing last night about, uh, you know, kind of the age gap. I made a comment about i got to be careful in trivia night, the questions I ask, because it reveals my age when I ask things that only I would know, because you guys are all younger than I am, and that's fine. But if you follow football at all and you're, and you're a football fan of, of any kind, then you should know who this is. This is Jerry Rice. Oh, Yeah. Jerry Rice played for the San Francisco 49ers. And while I'm not a 49ers fan, Jerry Rice is arguably the greatest wide receiver in the history of the National Football League. In addition to winning three Super Bowls, Rice holds nearly every single season and career receiving record available. He's the NFL's all-time leader in yards, receptions, and touchdowns. There are many experts who believe he's the best football player ever, regardless of position. Uh, And basically, Rice was a a one-in-a-lifetime talent talent, the best of the best. And what he's known for, not just the receptions and catches he made, was this. In team workouts, he was famous for his hustle. And and while many receivers would trot back to the quarterback after catching a pass, every play, Rice would sprint to the end zone. He would just complete the route and go all the way to the end. Uh, He would typically continue practicing long after the rest of the team had gone home. And uh, most remarkably, uh, he had six day-a-week off-season workouts. And he would just keep working out in the whole offseason, which he did all entirely on his own. And in the mornings, he would devote to his cardio, where he would run a hilly five-mile trail. And he would reportedly run 10 40-meter wind sprints up to the steepest part. And in the afternoons, he would go on to these equally strenuous weight training. And, and, and the workouts kind of became legendary in the league. Much as Much as he was a legend, other guys would start to take note of the things he would do. And a few of the other players in the league would, would try to join Rice just to see what his workouts were like, and many of them got sick before the day was over. Okay, just the guy was a machine. He was so good. Interestingly enough, before being drafted by the 49ers, Rice was reported as running the, 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 40, meter, uh, the 40 yard dash in 4.7 seconds. Now, for reference, in 2014, uh, there were multiple quarterbacks and, and defensive linemen that ran faster than that. Okay? And it's unlikely, though, that any of these players will have a career half as prolific as Jerry Rice. He designed his practice to work on his specific needs, and he, he, didn't, he, didn't, and he decided he didn't need to do everything well, just certain things, right? He had to run precise patterns. He had to evade defenders, uh, sometimes two or three that were assigned to cover him. He had to jump, out-jump them and st- to catch the ball and out-muscle them while he tried to strip it away and outrun tacklers. And so he focused his practice on exactly these requirements not being out, and, and so it turned out that not being the fastest wide receiver in the league didn't really matter because he worked harder than anybody. Now, I love stories like this, right? The dedication of athletes, the dedication of people committed to being the best they can be at their craft, right? Doing what no one else will do to get the results that no one else will. And Jerry Rice, in this kind of work ethic, it inspires me. I think about Tony Gwynn a lot. We've talked about him. He's my favorite baseball player. He's a man who was such a good batter that he struck out 434 times in a 20-year career. Now, if, to give you some perspective on that, Fernando Tatis Jr. has struck out 324 times in three years, okay, in a grand total of 273 games. So let's just give you an idea. Gwynn used to record himself and watch himself bat so he could figure out where to improve. And Jerry Rice and Tony Gwynn, both these players at the top of their game, both believe that someone else was training harder than they were. And so in order to overcome the obstacles that people would put in front of them, they trained and they focused and they practiced. It's what we call discipline. They had discipline. And so the point is this. My point is this. If an athlete, and this really convicted me a couple years ago, if an athlete can dedicate themselves to such high standards for a game, even regardless of how much they get paid, and they put the work into being the best they can be so they can make the biggest difference, then that is something that as Christians that we should do too. And Paul told Timothy, he says, rather train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also 
for this, for the life to come. You know, we talk about, you know, you could say, well, this guy's getting paid millions and millions of dollars to be this really, really good athlete. You could also argue that, well, we're paying for, we're, we're playing and working towards something imperishable and worth far more. So we should work as hard, if not more hard than some of these athletes. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about being disciplined by God, right? You know, kind of getting called on the carpet by God. His corrective work in our lives, that's a, this act of love that brings us into alignment with his will for our benefit. Uh, and that's on YouTube. Someone asked me today if we have our videos on YouTube. Yes, we do. You can find the old sermons there. But today, I'm going to talk about spiritual disciplines, spiritual disciplines. And these are the actions and the behaviors that we undertake to develop and improve ourselves spiritually. Now, when I say this, actions and behaviors, some people are going to perk up because I'm about to tell you the secret for how to become godly in three easy steps, except that I'm not. Right? Wouldn't that be nice? Like, do this, do this, do this. And the first thing I want us to make sure we understand as we talk about spiritual disciplines is this. Spiritual disciplines are not a to-do list. Okay? Spiritual disciplines are not a to-do list. So if I, we talk about these disciplines, I don't want you to immediately think, as long as I'm doing these things, check, 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 I'm good, right? I know many of us like expectations because they're easy to meet. And yes, the disciplines are things that we do, but it's not the doing that makes you godly, but how those things open the door for God to work in you. And so spiritual disciplines actively get you out of the way so that more of Christ can be real in your life. There's two books I'm going to quote from today. One is called The Celebration of Disciplines by Richard Foster, and the other one is The Spirit of the Disciplines by a guy named Dallas Willard. I'll bring those up again at the end. But in the book Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster says that spiritual disciplines, quote, open the door. And here's what he says. He says, the Apostle Paul writes that he who sows to his own flesh will, from the flesh, reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will, from the Spirit, reap eternal life. And Paul's analogy is instructive. He says, a farmer is helpless to grow grain. All he can do is provide the right conditions for the growing of grain. He cultivates the ground, he plants the seed, he waters the plants, and then the natural forces of the earth take over and up comes the grain. This is the way it is with spiritual disciplines. They are a way of sowing to the Spirit. And the disciplines are God's way of getting us into the ground. They put us where he can work within us and transform us. Because by themselves, the disciplines could do nothing. They can only get us to the place where something can be done. They are God's means of grace, and the inner righteousness we seek is not something that's just poured on our heads. And here's what he says. God has ordained the disciplines of the spiritual life as the means by which we place ourselves where he can bless us. Okay, it's a lot. Listen, for you list makers, it can be really easy to think that because I do certain things, I'm a mature believer, right? I'm doing all of these things, therefore I'm mature. But the Pharisees were list makers too, all right? Matthew 23, Jesus gave a scathing rebuke to the Pharisees. He says, they do all their deeds to be seen by others, and they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Well, what does that mean real quick? Quick uh, history lesson. The the, the Pharisees were known, uh, the Bible says to write the, the, in the Old Testament, to write the word of God on your your minds and on your wrists and your hands. And and so they would take that literally, they would take scripture and they'd write it on scrolls. They'd put it in a little box and they would bound it to their hands and their foreheads. And sometimes you'll see pictures of, of, of Orthodox Jews and they've got little boxes on their heads or strapped on their wrists. That's the word of God in there. They take them literally. And so some of these guys that look more spiritually would just make the boxes a little bigger and a little bigger and a little bigger. Or on their prayer shawls, they would have fringes. And so they would make these fringes super long. So just very noticeable. Like, look at me, look at me. So a giant box on their head, giant fringes, and it was just a symbol of, I look spiritual. So Jesus is calling them out. You know, they do their deeds to be seen by others. And then he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, uh, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. So what they were, what they were doing is, you know, uh, they knew they were supposed to tithe their income, so they would literally take all the like the individual leaves of the mint and like chop it up. Okay, here's my exact tenth, all right? This got a little too detailed. Uh, Justice and mercy and faithfulness you've neglected, and and these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Uh, Woe to you, which is an insult, by the way. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, and you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, making sure that what they were eating from was clean, part of their to-do list, 
but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, you first clean the inside of the cup, referring to themselves, and the plate that the outside may also be clean. So understand, first of all, that we know that spiritual disciplines are not a to-do list, and spiritual disciplines are not the measure of your maturity. But what they produce is, all right? They're not the measure of your maturity. It's not how many things you're doing. Because after all, there are plenty of biblical scholars out there, right, who, uh, who, who, who they know God's word even if they don't know Jesus. I always laugh anytime any time there's like a, you know, they've got this Bible scholar from some, some totally secular university and totally, they know the word of God even if they completely miss the point of the scriptures. But what spiritual disciplines do is they create environments where God can speak into our lives and transform us. And they create opportunities for God to reveal himself because they are meant to make less of us and more of him. So what I want to do is, is ask this question, what are the disciplines that allow us to be spiritually successful? And there's a lot of different people who would give you a lot of different lists, but we're going to go off of the book called The Spirit of Disciplines by Dallas Willard. And he offers a list of, of disciplines that God uses to transform us. But in as much as there are things to do, get this, there are also things to, to not do, Okay. And he divides his list up in two things, disciplines of abstinence and disciplines of engagement. Disciplines of abstinence and disciplines of engagement. Now, I've got the list there for you. We can, you can write them down if you want, but he says of abstinence, solitude, silence, fasting, frugality, chastity, secrecy, and sacrifice. And for engagement, study, worship, celebration, service, prayer, fellowship, confession, and submission. Now, I realized as I'm looking at this and studying this week, that the church, we very often promote the disciplines of engagement, right? The, these ideas, they, they appear everywhere, often as our purposes, right? We believe it, just in this ministry, God's, God's word, God's people, and God's work, right? There's your study, there's your fellowship, there's your, your service. Uh, and, and we do it in our practices, right? Church services, mission trips, small groups. They're like those, you know, you know smart goals, you know? There's, you know, you ever see those smart goals? They are, they're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and timely. I'm a spiritual person because I go to church and I do this and I do that and I do that. Those are all important things. Be here, do this, practice this, and we do need to do them. We need to study God's word and we need to pray and talk to God. We need to fellowship with God's people. We need to serve others and be Christ to them. We need to worship God and be in his presence. And, and, and I know that we talk about those things a lot in this class. I've talked about them. I promote them. It's a whole, you know, thing we do with our small groups and our missions trips to Alaska, all these things are about these disciplines of engagement. But because we spend so much time, I want to kind of talk about these other set of disciplines, these specifically these disciplines of, of abstinence. Now, if you grew up in the 90s or any time and you hear the word abstinence, you meet, our minds immediately go to sex, right? And, you know, be abstinent. And you, can, and you can see that chastity is listed here. But abstinence is more than just sex. Uh, Peter says in 1 Peter, he says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. And so really it means to stay away from anything that can interfere with our relationship with God, to not do those things and stay away from things that can get in the way. Uh, In his book, Goodness and Truth, uh, author W.R. Inge notes that disciplines of abstinence should be practiced by everyone, he says, leading to a sober and moderate use of God's gifts. He says, we feel that any habit harmless in itself is keeping us from God and sinking us deeper into the things of earth. If we find that things which others can do with impunity are for us the occasion of falling, abstinence is our only course. Abstinence or withholding these things alone can never uh, can, ne- uh, can recover for us the real value of what should have been for our help, but which has been an occasion for falling. It is necessary that we should resolve to give up anything that comes between ourselves and God. So I kind of want to go through this list and just kind of, what does this look like? What, is it, what do these things look like? Because I think they're things that we, we often neglect. I've been guilty of neglecting, but I think can really put us in a place like these authors are saying of, letting God speak into our life. So let's talk about solitude real quick. Solitude, it helps us get away from people. Anybody ever feel like you just got to get away from people? Yes, I see those hands all around the room. And what it does, though, is that when you're in a relationship with people, you get habits with people. You just get into rhythms with people, whether it's your family, whether it's your people at work, whether it's your friends. You act a certain way, you do certain things. You just get into this rhythm. And so 
Sometimes we need to get away from people and the habits that define those relationships. And Dallas Willard says it unlocks us from patterns of feelings and thoughts and actions. And he says in solitude, I like this, we find the psychic distance, the perspective from which we can see in the light of eternity, the created things that trap, that worry, and oppress us. You ever notice those moments where you're kind of by yourself and things just kind of kind of come into sharp focus and you kind of see things that you're like, I've never seen that before, I thought of that before, because you're alone and there's enough of the noise has been removed. And a lot of times, uh, solitude goes hand in hand with, with silence. It's when we get alone and we get quiet before God. Psalm 46, 10 says, be still and know that I am God. And this is the example of Jesus in the wilderness, right? Jesus went away and he was silent before God and he was alone and, and, and there, were, there was conversations happening, there was prayer happening. And silence is, silence is harder and harder to get, isn't it, these days, right? How many of you, and I will raise my hand as guilty, the moment you get, you know, five seconds to yourself, you go to your phone. I mean, I am, I am, I am ashamed of myself because sometimes we're sitting around watching a movie and someone, you know, we're, so, well, I'll pause it, I've got to go to the bathroom or whatever, right? And then you have this break in this movie, so I'm like, okay, well, what's on the gram? Because I can't sit for 90 seconds without trying to cram something else into my brain, right? And so, and we get scared of, we get scared of silence. We get scared of solitude. You know, you ever, got, you ever hear the, the quietest room in the world? You ever hear about that place? It's this place that absorbs so much sound, you can hear your heartbeat. They say that people, they see people in there like, the, the, can, can handle it for like 45 minutes before they just start getting, like going insane. We are not a people trained for silence. We're not people trained for solitude, okay? We are people who, who were so used to noise that silence terrifies us. But he's challenging us to, to seek solitude and to seek silence so that we can hear from God and, and experience God in ways when, when things are quiet where, you know, God can kind of, hey. Because remember, God often speaks in a whisper. I think we always, you know, when, when God showed up to Elijah, Elijah was in a cave and he says, you know, there's a whirlwind. And God was not in that. And then there was, a, uh, there was a fire, and God was not in that. There was an earthquake, God wasn't in that. But then there was a still, small voice. But Elijah had to be quiet enough to listen and hear that. And so we encourage us. Sometimes we do need to recuse ourselves, and we need to get work and be quiet, and we can be silent, and we can hear the Lord. And that's a discipline that we have to practice because that's not the way we're wired. We like noise. How many of you like to listen to music in the car? And just whatever it is, we just fill it in. We just fill that noise because silence is awkward. I mean, come on, you're talking around with your friends. You ever, you ever hear that seven-minute lull in a conversation? You're talking, like, it's this idea that everyone runs out of something to say. And everyone, ha, ha, ha. And then it just gets weird because it's silent because we don't like silence. But God encourages us to have solitude and silence. He also mentions fasting. Which, to be honest, we don't speak about in church very often, but it's something that many, uh, uh, that many early believers practiced. And Jesus modeled. He says, he says, just I want to point this out, when you fast, he said, not like if you fast, when you fast, don't look gloomy like the hypocrites who disfigure their faces, and their, and, uh, but he says, uh, so they can be seen by others. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. It's limiting, and what is fasting? Fasting is limiting our food and drink uh, intake for a period of time. It's, 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 you know, we talk about people taking, you know, Jesus fasted for 40 days. We've heard people t- fasting for three days or even 24 hours. It's just holding back on something that is so crucial to our life, something we're so used to. Come on, how, much, how many of our events just in young adults revolve around food? How many of the things that we do socially revolve around fo- food? How many of you wake up and the first thing you think is, is mm, breakfast, okay? <laughs> That's where our brains go. So, well, why would we do this? Dallas Willard says this. He says, fasting confirms our utter dependence on God by finding in him a source of sustenance beyond food. Persons well used to fasting as a systematic practice will have a clear and constant sense of their resources in God. Look, fasting is a hard discipline. I do know people who do it, do it successfully, but I'll admit it's one that has not taken a hold of my life, even as I'm aware of the benefits and the blessings that come from it. Uh, I'll be frank, many of my attempts have been more uh, focused on food than on God. Because what happens the second you can't have something? You start thinking about it all the time. And I tell you that because I want us to appreciate that these disciplines require us to be intentional 
understanding that if we seek solitude and silence or, or we choose to fast, then we have to endure it to a point that it has benefit for us. And again, this is no checklist, but opening a door for God to work. But, but when we leave a door open for God to work, we have to leave it open long enough for him to enter in, right? We have to leave it open long enough for God to decide, now is the time I'm, I'm coming in. So fasting, that's something to, that definitely, I mean, that could be a whole sermon and just bearing, bearing witness to that. Um, now, knowing my affinity for goodwill, I think you can appreciate this next one, frugality um, as a discipline. So what frugality is, is, is you know, I, I, I tease all the time how, that I'm patient and cheap, but, but Kristen likes to correct me, I am frugal. Right? I like to not spend full amounts of money on things, okay? Uh, but what it does, frugality does a lot of things in our, in our, in our life. It, it's really about helping us focus on our needs over our wants. Uh, frugality uh, uh, frees us up uh, oftentimes from debt, from overspending, from, 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 from hurting ourselves through our habits, right? You know, shopping is a real addiction for some people. Just spending money, you know, we talked about self-control before. For some people, self-control, impulse control, like their emotional uh, well-being is tied up in, you know, how do I do that? I go shopping, right? You know, some people do it with food. Some people do it with all sorts of things. It's different things. That, but frugality allows us to focus on God as our provider, showing that he'll give us what we need more so than just what we want. And what it does, too, what's cool about frugality is it allows God to demonstrate his powerful, powerful provision and I wonder how often we've rushed to purchase something that God just wanted to give us, right? That God just wants to give us. In fact, one of my greatest pet peeves is finding out I could have saved money on something had I just waited a bit longer. Right? It's just, ah, oh, man, I should have waited 10 days. Or like the next day you get the email, this is on sale now. Like, oh, man, can I get the discount, please? Okay, been there, done that. Here's the cool thing, though. I've also discovered that when I truly need something, it's going to be there. And usually, either God's going to give me the money for it, or it's usually cheaper than when I just wanted it. And so, frugality requires patience, and it requires self-control. And we also have to remember that patience and self-control are among the fruit of the Spirit. So as we live by the Spirit of God, frugality will manifest itself. But it is. It takes us being patient and going, I'm going to wait on the Lord to see how he's going to provide in this case. The next thing we come up to it's going to kind of go through these, is chastity, which echoes 1 Corinthians 6.18, where he says, flee from sexual immorality. Uh, for every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Now, I don't want to spend too much time here because we've talked about sex a lot in this class, uh, but chastity refers to keeping sex in its proper place, which is marriage, and it's also not violating the marriage covenant through adultery or pornography, it's not shunning sex and sexuality, but holding it sacred, protecting its boundaries, and realizing it in its fullest in the right context. And here's why. And here's why chastity is, is important, because sex and sexuality are like fire. With boundaries, they are safe, delightful, and comforting. Okay? But unbridled, they are out of and out of control, they are destructive, harmful, and dangerous. But our ability to control our passions and maintain our boundaries so that we can enjoy this divine gift often stems from perceiving and treating people as made in the image of God and choosing to love and honor them rather than perceive them as simply objects of desire. I find it very interesting that, you know, the, the, the thing about pornography and the thing about all these things that are out there is that these are just people that you don't know. They're just objects, you know, of, of things like that. They're imaginary versions of the real thing. And it's easy to objectify someone who we have no real connection to. And so Dallas Willard writes, he says, to practice chastity, then we must practice love, practice seeking the good of those uh, of the opposite sex we come into contact with at home and work and school and church or next door. Then we'll be free to practice the discipline of chastity is appropriate and gain only positive results from it. In other words, when you start looking at people as made in the image of God, you start looking at people as you know, a sister in Christ or a brother in Christ. You start looking at people as this is a person. They're not just an object of sexual desire, but a person made in the image of God and need to be treated as such. You start loving them the way that it, it, it removes some of that you know, desire to treat that person in an inappropriate manner. And again, that is a discipline. It takes practice. And you know, 
you get older, you start looking at things and you, know, you start having kids. Would I want someone looking at, you know, my child the way people look at this person? Maybe I should make sure I'm not that person. So this is just discipline of constantly practicing and putting in our mind, putting sex in its right place, sexuality in its right place. Sex and sexuality are not bad things. They are just things that need to be disciplined and have boundaries. And so then the last two disciplines of absence he mentions are secrecy and sacrifice. And, and secrecy is a discipline of not seeking credit for our actions or our walk with God. Okay, it, He said we are leaving our public relations department in the hands of God and then allowing him to decide when our deeds should be known. Matthew 6, 5 says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. And truly, I say to you that they have received the reward. Now, I think it's safe to say that social media is the new street corner. Okay? And we need to be really careful about how we present our actions and our disciplines. And we can't fall prey to the idea that if it isn't posted, it never happened. And, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a fine line because sometimes I think we, we love to celebrate altruism. We love to celebrate people who are doing things. But at the same time, we have to be careful when we're posting those things to not look like, hey, look at me. You know, look at me. You know, it's, you know if you're uh, people posting every morning. You know, I, I, I'm curious sometimes, and I'm not knocking anybody in here, but sometimes we can post, like, here's a picture of my Bible and my cup of coffee, you know, and, you know, and I see a lot of that going around now, too. You know, hashtag first things first and things like that. And it's like, great. That, uh, uh, good job. You read your Bible. Like, that's the bare minimum. Good job. Um, and it's kind of like the same thing. And, you know, it's almost like when people, like, made it to the gym, you know, got your, your selfie pic. And good for you. Uh, does that make you look good or make me look bad? I'm not sure. But we, we have to be, we have to be uh, careful of this thing. I know it's a big, a big thing in the news, like, some of these altruists, what's that guy, Mr. Beast, goes around and doing all this stuff, and some people are just out there, and like, yeah, he's doing good, and other people are like, he's just making himself look good. And it's this delicate balance, but, you know, let your, we are to let our light shine before men, but how much better when someone else shines the light for us? Uh, Dallas Willard says, he says this, he says, secrecy at its best teaches love and humility before God and others, and that love and humility encourage us to see our associates in the best possible light, even to the point of our hoping that they will do better and appear better than us. And here's the thing I want to encourage you with. We are better off to sing someone else's praises than toot our own horn. In fact, who knows, someone else might be singing a song about us, and I'll bet it sounds a whole lot better coming from their lips than our own. So instead of being your own cheerleader, be a cheerleader for somebody else. And that's what secrecy is and if we're cheerleading for other people what's that parable jesus says when you go in don't seat at the head of the table because then someone who's more important than you comes in it's real awkward because then you got to get up and you got to move down and take whatever seats left he said no 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 you sit at the foot of the table and then someone says what are you doing down here brother you should be sitting up here and you're like yeah that's right you gotta walk up okay (laughs) so and finally we have sacrifice He says, the discipline of sacrifice is one in which we forsake the security of meeting our needs with what is in our hands. It is total abandonment to God, a stepping into the darkened abyss in the faith and hope that God will bear us up. And we see this in the life of Abraham. Sacrifice. He was preparing to sacrifice Isaac. And he knew the the, the promises of God that even if Isaac was to be raised from the dead to accomplish them. But what does that look like in my life? What does it look like in your life? Sometimes that means giving up life on our terms. Sometimes it means laying down our hopes and dreams, believing that God can give them back to us. And it looks like saying that our spouse and our job and our kids belong to God and that he can do with them as he sees fit for his glory. And it looks like taking a leap of faith, not knowing exactly what the landing looks like, but only knowing that we're supposed to jump because God promises that we'll be okay. And this discipline is hard because we will be asked to sacrifice and surrender over and over and over again. Because anything that God gives us, he can take. And anything we think we earned on our own, he can take. And it's very often the the very things that we lay down, our provisions and our relationships, even our fear of death or of having a life of significance, that God is able to return to us restored and renewed better than we laid it down. Matthew 16 says, whoever would save his life will lose it. Whatever loses his life for my sake will find it. I'll give you two examples. One, I was reminded of this when Pastor was talking in his message today on Mr. Holland's opus about how 
he, you know, he wanted to do all these things, but he just kind of did the daily grind of, of serving these students. And at the end, he was raised up, and they could see all the things he was able to do in the life. He made a difference. I was recently at the, um, a couple months ago, I was at the, the local bike park, and there's ways that you can train, and you can jump off different heights, you know, and you know, learn how to ride your mountain bike off of, you know, uh, the, these steps. And it's kind of fun, but, you know, if you look at the step that's a couple feet tall, it's a little scary, but good news is they have right next to it one that's like six inches tall. You just kind of roll off this thing. And I really believe that in our life of faith, that God doesn't always ask us just to jump off the biggest jump. He wants us to learn, to, he wants us to take little steps of faith and, and jump off the little things first and trust him with that. Oh, I'm okay. I landed okay. He's like, great, try the next one. Let's try something a little bit bigger. And if you constantly go through and you practice with these, and trusting God in these little things, these little bumps of faith and kind of go, oh, went off. Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm on two wheels. Yeah. Or you go off a little bit bigger. Oh, that was a little scary, but I'm okay. I'm okay. Pretty soon you'll find yourself going over these, these larger things with confidence because you know that you're going to land on your feet in, in, our, in our spiritual life. It's because God is faithful. He's asking us to jump, but he also promises to jump with us. So that's what sacrifice does. Whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Well, so what? Spiritual disciplines, what does that mean? When we say abstinence, we often think of what we should not do. But in every example that we talked about, I want to point this out. We are, whenever we are asked to step out of one thing, we're asked to step in to something else. Okay, Out of the crowd and into God's presence. Out of the noise and into a place where we can hear God better. Out of the need to provide for ourselves our greatest desires and into dependence and trust that yields even greater blessings. Out of the need to be recognized and into the joy of lifting others up. And I want, I want you to practice the disciplines of engagement, like Dallas Willard said. But, and we already practice them regularly as a church, and we'll continue to promote them as important healthy habits. But these, these disciplines of abstinence we talked about today, where we step back and let God increase, can be the hardest they're the internal work, the things that a lot of people don't see happening on the inside. Dallas Willard, one more time. Abstinence, he says, then makes a way for our engagement. He says, if the places in our blood cells designed to carry oxygen are occupied by carbon monoxide, we die for lack of oxygen. And if the places in our souls that are to be indwelt by God in his service are occupied by food and sex and society, we die or we languish for lack of God and right relation to his, creation, to his creatures. A proper abstinence actually breaks the hold of improper engagements so that the soul can be properly engaged in and by God, right? So it's like going to the gym, right? If the disciplines of engagement are, are lifting out, doing cardio, the disciplines of abstinence are your diet. It's what you fuel your body with. And often a person's diet will be the determining factor of a good workout. And a life without both of these disciplines manifested is incomplete and imbalanced. So if you're, gonna, if you're not satisfied with how your workout is going, right, if the engagement disciplines, going to church, reading your Bible, are not satisfying or feel incomplete, consider these abstinence disciplines. Maybe the reason you don't enjoy the word or fellowship or worship or your prayers feel like they're hitting the ceiling is because we're not listening to God or we're spending wrong or we're ignoring our own purity. And maybe something there needs to be developed so that the other disciplines can flourish. So we just want to be disciplined people whose whole being inside out is given over to God in his service. All right, let's pray in discussion. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for these disciplines. Uh, 